Welcome. Maybe we can move a little closer. That's fine. Uh, my, name, my name is Jay Rush. I'm going to talk about True Blocks, which is a project I, I've been building for about three years. Uh, the fundamental idea is that I think that if you truly want to be sovereign and private, you have to have a local source of data. You can't be reliant on some third-party provider for data. So for me, the easiest way to do that is to run the node software locally on my machine. So this laptop here is running, um, uh, in this screen it's running Prism, in this screen it's running Aragon. So I'm going to start both of those pieces of software up. So that's Prism, and this is Aragon. I'm going to do something weird here. I'm going to turn off my Wi-Fi because I want to demonstrate that uh, this is a truly um, local piece of software and it's truly decentralized. Aragon starts complaining like crazy because it's saying, I can't find the internet. But as soon as I turn it back on, Aragon's fine. So I want to build a piece of software that has a purely local source of data and has no reliance whatsoever on third parties. So that's what TrueBlocks does. So I'm going to switch. Um, I'm going to switch to uh, another screen and talk about TrueBlocks. I'm going to give you a little view of the server in the background. This thing is still complaining like crazy because it doesn't have an internet connection. But true, but the node still serves data to the application. So we have an application called Shifra, which is part of TrueBlocks. And it has a whole bunch of tools, one of which is blocks. So I'm going to say Shifra blocks 12. And it's going to deliver to me block 12. I can say Shifra blocks 12 to 10 million in steps of 1,000. And it delivers all the blocks in, in uh, every 1,000th block from the chain, totally disconnected from the internet, which is exactly the point of what I'm trying to build. So you could use this, for example, for data science. Um, one of the really nice um, features of this blocks command is a, is a subcommand called unique. And what that does, it lists all unique addresses in a block. So I can say block um, 1 million and 1. That's all the unique addresses in a block. And I wanted to build that because I wanted to build an index of addresses and where they appear in which block and in which transaction. So I can do a more complicated block, 17 million. So there's hundreds of unique addresses in block 17 million 100,000. So, but we want to know where every one of those addresses appear because we're building an index because in order to make the node software that's running locally effective as an application server, uh, we needed an index. We needed to be able to index addresses. So um, let me close this. Um, as I said, Shifra has a, a bunch of uh, different tools. One of them is called Daemon, which starts a server and serves all of the other tools. So I'm going to start that. So here I started a server that's pulling data only from the node, and it's serving all the commands for Shifra. And then we build applications on top of that. So this is an application. It's running locally. I'm still disconnected from the internet. It takes a while to start up. But this is our application that's pulling a history of this account from directly from the from the uh, directly from the node software, and this application is really really interesting to me because it has all these qualities that you wouldn't expect. It's really fast. I just looked through the hist the the five thousand transaction history of an account 
which you can do if you go to a web server, but you're going to get rate limited on that web server. You're going to get one page at a time. And there's a reason for that. That's because the web server is being shared by thousands of other users. This is one user for one application. I can hit my own web server a thousand times faster than I can hit a remote web server. So I can get a lot of data into an application way more quickly. And we have now an index of where to look. So that index is really important to the application because I can query and get a very precise list of the transactions that I'm interested in, as opposed to the way the node software works, where I have to query a range of blocks and look for data. So um, this application is rough, I admit. I'm not a um, front-end developer, but it has these qualities that are, that, that are really strange. There's no pagination. I can scroll through this like I'm, I'm scrolling through a through a uh, spreadsheet. And what we do, because we have every single transaction, is we can do what I call a reconciliation. So here, this is saying I spent die. I had 2,000 die. I spent 90. And now I should have 2,000, you know, 90 less than 2,000. And it reconciles. And then here, I'm going from I know I had this much die at the last transaction, so I have that much die at the next transaction. So we can reconcile our history perfectly throughout the entire history of an account. And if you have that, you have automated accounting. And to me, automated accounting off-chain, if you know anything about trying to do that, you know that it's nearly impossible. The reason it's nearly impossible is because they don't have good indexing on these remote um, APIs. So. I'm going to t uh, switch now completely. That was just sort of a demonstration of what we built. I'm going to try to help you understand how we built this. So, uh, and this has, this has another really interesting um, aspect to it. Uh, we use IPFS to share this index. And because we can do that, we can make the cost of running our system, we kind of push the cost off onto the end users. And running the system becomes zero cost for us. All we do is provide the software. And uh, I think this challenges um, any application that's going to charge me $250 a month to access tax information or, or transactional history information. So we can wildly lower the cost of these applications. And I think that's a direct result of this Web3 technology is uh, one of the results, if we use it correctly, is that the cost of doing these operations becomes near zero. So I want to try to get to that point. Uh, about myself, um, I used to work at IBM Research a long time. I was heavily into the early internet, got totally disillusioned, became a poet and a writing teacher, and then um, came back into the uh, tech field in 2015 when I first heard of Ethereum, and I've been here ever since. Um, as I said, I want to build an application that has, huh? I want to, are we good? I want to build an application that has only one source of data, which is the node, and no third-party uh, web APIs, because I think this actually delivers on all of the original visions, such as self-sovereignty, uh, perfect accounting, which builds truly transparent organizations if you can do accounting from the outside. And uh, that leads to coordination. Um, I talked about Shifra. And um, this is that command that gives me all the unique blocks. And this is the data that we look through. Um, one of the things that TrueBlocks does that a lot of other things don't do is we look at all the obvious places where there are addresses in the data, all these pink things. But then we also go into the input data and the trace output data and the log data, and we scan through that, those bytes and we pull off addresses that other people don't find. And that's why we can do reconciliation, and that's why it works. Um, I won't go into exactly what we do, but a very simple example is right here. That log topic is 32 bytes long, and it has six, or 16 leading zeros. 
And what we do is we say, that looks a lot like an address, so we're going to call it an address for our index. A lot of people wouldn't include that in their index. And that's why they're missing data, I think. Uh, we compared ourselves to Etherscan. We did 5,000 addresses, and on average, we find 13% more um, transactions, al almost all of them in that input data that we look at. And then we convert those into why were they missed, and a lot of these transactions that are being missed by regular indexers are financial-related um, functions, and that's why reconciliation doesn't work on most platforms because they're missing financial transactions. Um, so I'm just going to skip ahead here. So I said we, we look at every block and we build a, a index, we build a list of, um, we look at every block and we build a list of addresses that appear in those blocks. And then a regular indexer takes that list and continually sorts that list by address because that's what an index is but we wanted to share this on IPFS. And if you're continually adding new addresses into this list, this IPFS address changes at every block. So that didn't work for us. So what we did is we basically stopped adding new data to this list and we created, uh, um, we created an immutable, unchangeable chunk. We call this a chunk of the index. So I say we created a time-ordered log of an index of a time-ordered log. And if you think about it, this is exactly what blockchains do. They create time-ordered logs of transactions. And for the same exact reason, we did this because we wanted a hash that would stay permanent forever. So, so we collect two million of these records, and then we create a chunk. And now we can put this in IPFS as a frozen forever immutable block or chunk, we call it. Uh, that whole process is called scraping. And we, uh, a normal API, a, a remote web server, takes this index and delivers it directly to the user. But you can see the relationship here. Who has the data? The indexer has the data. So this end user is completely at the, at the uh, control of this data provider. They can cut off the access. They can change the data. They can lie about the data. They can withhold the data. They can charge for the data. So that, that to us was not Web3. And we want to deliver the data from an immutable store, which allows us to just publish it once and never kind of have to publish it again. So we move the end user over here. We write our data to IPFS with a hash, an IPFS hash. And then we keep a list of all of these hashes in a thing we call a manifest, and we publish that manifest to IPFS as well. And now the end user can get this manifest, and in the manifest is every part of the entire index. And we publish it to IPFS, so we can't take it back. If they have the hash and they uh, acquire it, they have it forever, and we can't take it back. We go further to publish this hash into a smart contract that we call the unchained index. And then the end user can use these command line tools on a local computer to basically download the entire index if he wants. And then he can use other tools to serve data to his application. The trouble with this is it's 100 gigabytes big, this index. So there's a really beautiful uh, data structure called a bloom filter, which lets you basically say, is my address in this, in this list? And this thing goes from 40 megabytes to like 40K or something. So I get a bloom filter associated with each one of these chunks as well. And that gets added to the manifest as well. So when the user downloads, he gets three gigabytes. So the user can download an, an index of the entire Ethereum mainnet chain for three gigabytes. And he can ask questions. Can you give me a list of every, every appearance that my address has ever appeared in by querying this three gigabyte bloom filters? 
getting a result that says, I have two or three of these chunks, and then downloading the larger chunks. And now he has this very fast, very detailed view into the Ethereum mainnet, completely unrelated to a publisher. There's nobody withholding the data here. I can withhold publishing the hash, but this is permissionless, so anyone can publish this hash to it. It's purposefully permissionless. So what I want to see people do is realize that I'm publishing a hash to an index to every single appearance of every address on the chain once a day or once a week. Anyone can pull that thing and have an index for themselves and build local applications. And I did that on purpose because I wanted to destroy, I want to destroy the ability of these people to control your access to this index. And I, I, I don't want it to be me doing this. I want you to run this and publish to IPFS and share on the smart contract. So we get hundreds of people publishing where the data is. And we've destroyed the ability of these guys to charge us $250 for it a month. <clears throat> the other really beautiful thing that happens, hard to explain, is you get that chunk, this chunk, and that chunk. I get three or 10 or 50 other chunks and what happens is I pin all of these chunks down on my own machine, and the software automatically pins the chunks that you download on your machine. And pretty soon, we're all pinning our own data, and we're all sharing it with each other. <clears throat> so we get, this, we get this naturally sharded database. And another thing that's really, really interesting is I'm a small user. I have 5,000 transactions. So I'm going to get one one hundredth of the entire index. Uniswap, if they were running a system like this, would get every single part of the index. And they would pin every single part of the index because they appear in every single part of the index. And that's, to me, fair. Uniswap should be sharing the entire index with the whole community. They're using 10% you know, of the entire resources of the system. So each person who participates carries a burden that's exactly equivalent to their usage, which to me is fair. So um, I think that's a very interesting thing that just falls out of. There's no design decision to, to make there. It just falls out of this way of doing it. And I think this is like a web three way of doing it. And today what we're building is this. And we're literally, gonna, we're literally walking into a buzzsaw, in my opinion. Because all we're doing, we're giving away all of our sovereignty to the people that have the index, which I think is just a, a bad choice, in my opinion. So uh, just to conclude, I think I must be close to done, yeah. <clears throat> um, I've taken care of web. I've taken advantage of Web3. I didn't run away from Web3. I didn't use Web2 solutions to try to build the solution. I wholeheartedly embraced Web3. Um, the index is completely uncapturable. Once, once it's here, I can't stop anyone on the planet from looking at it and getting every one of these chunks. As long as someone is pinning them, I think maybe the Ethereum Foundation should pin them or some, something, or IPFS should pin them or something. Um, it's uncapturable, though, because I can't intercede between the user's local machine and a smart contract. I can't say that he can't have access to that. Um, it's perfectly private. It's, uh, to me, the only, I'm not connected to the internet right now, and my application works perfectly well. And the node software isn't getting any fresh data, but that's my choice. I can choose to join the network. Whereas if you're going to a website for data, you can't choose to join. Um, it has this other really other interesting uh, aspect. If a website gets 100 new users in a day, they have to go out to the store and buy another computer because they have to serve 100 more users. Whereas if this system gets 100 new users, we're getting 100 new people sharing the index. So the system actually gets more robust, more distributed, and more resilient the more people who come. And this is on purpose 
not from TrueBlocks, but from IPFS. That's how IPFS works. Um, I wanted to build it so that users didn't have to do anything. All they have to do is start an application. The application looks at the smart contract, gets the data, downloads the thing, pins everything. And the user's just using this really fast, really accurate, really deep insight into their data. Uh, they don't have to do anything special. Um, it's equitable, which means heavy users are, carry a heavy burden and light users carry a light burden. Um, we're reading directly from the blockchain, which has hashed data, which is undeniably contains the bytes that it came from. And we're using those bytes as our only source of information. So the results that we get are perfectly reproducible because we come from bytes that are known to be true. We do a very simple algorithm and you can reproduce it. So we don't have to build some complicated prover, some complicated um, watcher fisherman system that has a coin on top of it to incentivize people to make this accurate. It's just accurate because we're coming straight from block data and we're indexing with a known algorithm. And the cost is zero. I published to a smart contract, it cost me $3 a day, $3 a day to publish. My entire infrastructure cost me $3 a day. I run IPFS locally. I, um, you know, people use the software and share the data. Uh, they're carrying the burden, and that's by design and on purpose. So um, I hope I made my point. Um, the point being that we should turn, we should, we should build applications. I know, I know this is insane. I'm not crazy. But we should run our own node software. And we should not allow the node software to become a piece of software that serves big data providers because it's going to become increasingly more difficult to run a node if we allow the node to get pulled towards big data providers. We should be pulling the node back down so it runs on laptops so we can access data without asking permission from anyone. Um, if we do that, we're going to quickly learn we need an index, and TrueBlocks provides one method to do that. It's not the only way. Um, but I want to build truly distributed, perfectly private, and local first applications, and that's what TrueBlocks is about. So thanks for listening, and uh, I'm happy to answer questions if I'm allowed. Yeah, let's take one. one question? Any question? Sure. <clears throat> Thank you. So now I, I see that you rely on IPFS as a storage layer for indexing, but uh, is your approach storage layer agnostic? So, I mean, if somebody would like to use some other solution for that. Yeah, storage ag agnostic. Okay. Yeah, I, should use, I shouldn't necessarily use IPFS. What I should use is content addressable storage. Um, I don't care where. Um, somewhere we put immutable data. And to me, that's content addressable. Um, IPFS is kind of the most likely place, and Ethereum mainnet is kind of the most likely place. So, yeah, I'm a little um, focused on those, but, yeah, I should broaden that, yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Jay. Thanks.